Allow me to be frank with you. This is on the 23rd of June, 2016. These statements are just surreal. And they do not seem to be a concrete plan for a coup d'etat at all. I do not believe these statements, not at all. And finally, what's the last coup attempt that the defense fake history claims that they have proven? Nunchia says in May 1978, he talks about a Sao Pim attempt at a coup. But we heard extensive evidence in this court about exactly what happened in May 1978, and it proves the opposite. But the evidence shows that in the 25th, that for a long time before May 1978, the regime had begun a purge of East Song soldiers. Sao Pim had cooperated in that purge, cooperated in having some of his own soldiers arrested and taken to S-21. On the 25th of May, there was a major operation by KPOC's forces where many of the commanders of Sao Pim's forces were arrested and executed. And at that point, Sao Pim became aware that something was happening. Mia Sun testified on the 29th of June, 2016, about getting about a letter from Sao Pim. And he said, and it shows how confused Sao Pim was at that time. He said Sao Pim's letter stated it was a coup d'etat to overthrow the comrade secretary and the comrade deputy secretary by armed forces led by Sun Sen. So Sao Pim, being naive at the time, unaware that he, one of the most senior leaders, long time leaders of the DK and of the Khmer Rouge, was himself a target of the center. He thought that Sun Sen was leading a coup against the secretary, Pol Pot, and the deputy secretary, which would be Nun Che. And that's why some of the witnesses, those from the East Zone, talked about it being a coup by Pol Pot. Long Sat, witness who was a uh, medical soldier, so the head of the medical unit in one of the divisions, said it was Sun Sen who initiated the coup d'etat. He said that was Sao Pim's analysis. He talked to Sao Pim. Excuse me. Long Sat said he talked to Sao Pim in late 1977. This is when the purges were beginning of the East Zone. And he asked uh, Sao Pim about what was going on. Did, did, did Sao Pim think that Paul Pot was betraying him? And Sao Pim told him, no, it was Sun Sen, not Paul Pot. So naive was Sao Pim that he actually, as we've shown without doubt in the evidence in this case, through mainly defense witnesses, that he himself went to Phnom Penh. After his commanders were being arrested and killed on the 25th of May, he told his troops he was going to go sort it out. He got in the car with a few bodyguards, two cars, and drove to Phnom Penh. As the defense witness Nong Nim testified to on the 12th of December last year, he said, quote, during that time, if he, Sao Pim, had chosen to flee, he could have done that. But he was an honest person. He was loyal to Pol Pot. He said he just wanted to see Pol Pot and find out what was wrong. Long Sat pointed out that the people that were being killed were the very soldiers that had been fighting against Vietnam. The defense claim is this is part of a Vietnamese plot. But Long Sat, is Jara getting the interpretation or should I stop? There is a problem with the interpretation system. Il y a, il semble avoir un problème avec le système d'interprétation.
Thank you, Mr. President. Merci, Mr. President. Long Sat had long fought long uh, against the Vietnamese. Long he and uh, the forces of Sao Pim were the primary forces that had battled the Vietnamese in 1977 and 78. And he said the following when he about uh, his knowledge of events before the 25th of May. 78. He said, people were killed. I mean, chiefs of division were killed. And I concluded that those who killed these people were traitors, no one else. We defended the border. Why were we killed? And, Your Honors, there's other evidence of the real history that simply is incompatible with the defense version that large sections of the DK army and forces were intent always on overthrowing and killing Pol Pot, Nunchea, and the center. One of the pieces of evidence is the fact that Nunchea and Pol Pot traveled to the very zones where they claim the forces were concentrated intent upon killing them and overthrowing them. We know from E3 1339, a radio broadcast, that in December 1977, in the middle of Vietnam's incursion into Cambodia, <coughs> Pol Pot traveled to the northwest, excuse me, <coughs> to the northwest zone, Ru Nim's area, with a very important Chinese guest, along with Born Bet, who was also later purged. And there he was warmly greeted by Ru Nim. So why wouldn't Ru Nim, who was in charge of that zone and had all these forces, not kill Pol Pot then? Why would, was Pol Pot so confident, if there was an open war, to travel to the very heart of Ru Nim's territory. The same thing, the defense showed many times a visit by Pol Pot to the eastern zone to see Sao Pim. It's in a video they showed several times in court, E3 3015R. And we know that Nunchea traveled often to the northwest zone and also to the east zone. Do you recall the testimony from one of Sao Pim's personal bodyguards and actually a relative of Sao Pim, Sin Ong? He said not only would Nunchea come often and visit at the headquarters of Sao Pim, he actually slept in the headquarters of Sao Pim's bodyguard. So if there was such an intent of these east zone and northwest zone, to overthrow and kill Pol Pot, they had every opportunity to do so, and they never did. They traveled there with lightly guarded, and they were never touched. Another piece of evidence that shows how illogical the defense theory is about zones, autonomous zones, vying for power and influence, is the construction of the center army. During the Civil War, all of the various forces were part of zonal, zonal armies, sector armies. But there was a reorganization after the 1975 victory. And in that reorganization, divisions were taken from all of the zones. All of the zones gave up some of their own forces, including the Northwest Zone and the Eastern Zone, to form the center army. You don't do that if you're intent on overthrowing the center, give them your own troops. Stepping back and just looking at these uh, Khmer Rouge, the DK's paranoid theories of all these internal enemies, it becomes obvious how illogical they are. Six of the seven zone leaders were purged, were labeled as traitors and purged. How could they have won the war? How could they have maintained power if six of the seven zone leaders were traitors? They also claim that three secretaries of the autonomous sectors, that they were all traitors, they all were purged. In Siem Reap Sot, in Preah Vihir Hang, and in Prati Yi. The DK also claims commanders of five of the nine 
affirme également Army que divisions, les commandants Revolutionary Army Kampuchea divisions divisions were traitors. Les neuf que compte Division, division 170, Chakri, Division 290, Tal. On in 310, Song in 450, Chin in 920. Along with claiming one of the standing committee members, Born Vet, the head of the Office 870, Dun. How could they have maintained power? How could they have won the Civil War? How could they have maintained power if the majority of those commanding troops were traitors? It makes no logical sense. Q. Sampan knew this. He, he was asked, uh, I believe it was by OCIJ, excuse me, I believe it was Stephen Hedder, about what percentage of enemy agents were in the senior ranks. And he said, less than half in the Alors, Central Committee, but nearly half in the Standing Committee. But it's interesting to contrast that with how Q. Sampan described meetings of the, of the Standing Committee. Q. Sampan said the following. He said, quote, Judging from what I saw during the expanded sessions of the Permanent Bureau, the Standing Committee, nothing approaching fear was apparent during these meetings. Indeed, the meetings were informal. They were more like a family reunion. Members would often take time out to tell jokes. The defense, the, the witness uh, on the Khmer Viet Campuchia Vietnam relations that the defense asked to call Stephen Morris in his book said the following. Page 106. There is no evidence that the people whom Pol Pot emissaries attempted to kill were agents of Vietnam. On the contrary, the people, the people Pol Pot was now attempting to kill had loyally carried out orders from the Khmer Rouge leadership for the previous three years. And then on, he said, Sao Pim had been one of the most staunch advocates of attacking the Vietnamese. Even the DK government acknowledges that except for after the 25th of May when there was some organized resistance in the Sauf eastern zone, May, they said in E3703, a 1987 DK document Il after the regime, there was no pitched battles. Régime, we arrested one or two at a time. Nous, uh, And your honors, uh, Tuan was a witness who the defense has relied on at times. And he talked about Ru Nim, his, uh, apparently his stepfather or adopted father. And he said in his transcript with, that was provided by Lemkin the following about Ru Nim. He said, I am furious with him. If he had stood up and did resistance, there wouldn't be millions of people killed. If he did the resistance, he would not arrest his fellow soldiers. He still arrested them for Ankar. Because what we saw is that Runyam and Sao Pim, who were, the prosecution absolutely acknowledges, part of the JCE until they themselves were caught up in the purge when the revolution began to eat its own children. They themselves cooperated in arresting their own soldiers, again contradicting the claim that they were plotting against the center. And some of this can be shown by arrests at the East Zone. If we could show slide one, this is an annex 6.4 to our final trial brief. If you look and you see, while the arrests in the East Zone uh, certainly went up Vous over time, temps, even before May 1978. So if you look at the pink color, si all of these arrests occurred before rouge. the supposed coup, which actually was when Pol Pot began massively executing East Zone commanders. 
All of that area in pink, all of those arrests occurred before that time. And if we can show the next slide, 6.5, these are the arrests from the northwest zone. We call Rue Nim was not arrested until June 1978. Again, the pink are all of these persons from the northwest zone detained in S21 before Rue Nim was arrested, showing that these purges began long before, and that Nim and Sao Pim cooperated with them for a long time. As I said, when Sao Pim became aware, finally, that you know, something was going on, but still being naive and thinking it must be Sun Sen acting against him or acting against trying to overthrow Pol Pot and Nunchia, he got in a car and he went to Phnom Penh. And this is even confirmed from a contemporaneous uh, or from a DK document. It's actually a 1987 document that the then DK movement issued. It's E3703. And they said this. He said, Sao Pim fled by car. He even tried to be in touch with the deputy secretary. There. That would be, of course, Nunchea, who categorically refused to see him. How else do we know, Your Honors, absolutely, that Vietnam had not, as the defense claim, penetrated the upper ranks of the CPK? Well, part of it is from these documents recovered from the Soviet archives. E39644, of course, is this book by Mosyakov about uh, his findings in the Soviet archives. And recall what he found in one of these documents. A report saying, quote, Li Duan, and I believe this is a report of the Soviet ambassador at the time. Li Duan, leader of the Vietnamese con communists, in a conversation with the Soviet ambassador, called a politician of pro-Vietnam orientation as the occupant of the second most important post of the party. Speaking of Nun Chea, Li Duan literally emphasized, and in the document it says in quotes, he is our man indeed and my personal friend. So, Your Honors, we don't say, we don't believe Nguyen Chea during the DK regime was an agent for Vietnam. What this shows is how completely in the dark the Vietnamese were about what was going on in the CPK. They actually thought that their good friend in the CPK was Nguyen Che. And it's understandable why they would think that, given the history of Nguyen Che, because there is a long connection between Nguyen Che and Vietnam. Again, we're not saying during DK he was an agent. But remember, he himself told you, beginning of this trial, that he joined the ICP, the Vietnamese-led Indo-Chinese Communist Party, after being recruited by a Vietnamese cadre. He joined that party and he was loyal to it. He even said he was chosen to go to Vietnam for two years of training. And Nguyen Chia became a leader of this movement, which he acknowledges was led by Vietnamese, aimed at overthrowing the government and the monarchy of Cambodia. Back in the 1950s and 1960s, he was cooperating with the Vietnamese to overthrow the government of Cambodia, the elected government and the monarchy. He told Tet Sambat, quote, I liked to read Vietnamese books about arrest of Communist Party members and torture. So perhaps that's where he gained some of his ideas for how he operated S21 by reading Vietnamese books about arrests of party members and torture. He even bragged to Tet Sambat about how when the Khmer Rouge were attacking 
making a major offensive on Phnom Penh, they needed ammunition. How he went and negotiated with the Vietnamese, he said he went and arranged a meeting with Nguyen Van Linh, this is on page 74 of Behind the Killing Fields, and they met in Sao Pim's office. Nguyen Chea told Tetsambat that though there was an interpreter, he spoke in Vietnamese to make the ammunition request. He told the Vietnamese that the CPK needed to borrow one million bullets. And he got them. Your Honours, shortly after the Lan Nol coup, according to the Soviet archives, a Vietnamese diplomat explained to a Soviet the presence of a large number of Vietnamese troops in Cambodia. And what he told the Soviet diplomat is, Nun Chia has asked for help, and we have liberated five provinces of Cambodia in 10 days, E3-9644. So, back in 1970, Nun Chia was happy to cooperate to bring Nunchia Vietnamese troops into Cambodia. Your Honor, I've gone through this fake history simply for the sake of establishing what is true and what isn't. But again, I reiterate, even if there was resistance, even if the fake history was true, it wouldn't justify a single detention without legal process. Not the torture of one person at S21, not a single execution. But perhaps the most telling example of the weakness of Nun Chia's history is the fact that his brief and his oral argument rely upon confessions from S21. In his brief, he even relies upon confessions he acknowledges were obtained by torture. In his oral argument, he talks about a couple of confessions that he claims people were not mistreated at all. Your Honor, our position has been clear from the beginning. Every individual in S21 was subjected to torture. The evidence that Nun Chia attempts to use from these confessions is evidence that's written with the agony of the victims of that torture. The torture convention defines torture as any act which involves severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, intentionally inflicted on a person for purposes of obtaining information or for punishment and other reasons. The Declaration on the Protection of All Persons from Torture provides in Article 3, no state may permit or tolerate torture or other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Except exceptional circumstances such as a state of war or a threat of war, internal political instability or any other public emergency may not be invoked as a justification of torture or other cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment. Your Honor, when people walked through the gates of S21, they were subjected to torture. Can you imagine the terror? They were blindfolded, they were stripped to their underwear. My colleague has talked about this in more detail. They were shackled, shackled next to other living human corpses, unable to bathe, forced to defecate in a box, not allowed to speak, fed only spoonfuls of food per day, consumed with hunger, and all of them undoubtedly in extreme fear, expecting, fearing execution, expecting, fearing torture. Does any defense possibly think that shackling a person 24 hours a day is not mistreatment? 
pensez-vous que any un travail de personne pendant 24 heures, heures est-ce que ce n'est pas de la torture 24 heures par jour Nuntia, le, la défense de Nuntia ne ferait-elle pas objection si son client était entravé 24 Your heures Honor, par jour it's not, you can torture someone without laying a Monsieur hand le juge, on them. vous pouvez torturer quelqu'un sans police interview someone with a gun pointed to their head or a knife at their throat that's clearly torture threats to physically Avec harm the victim or the victim's family have been found by cases to be torture. Uh, and uh, just famille. in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not going to cite those cases because it takes too long. But just one example of a case that's cited in the Nunchia brief, again, the Elashku case, Elashku versus Moldova. Threats to kill the victim's family was considered to be torture. Also in Akox versus Et Turkey, the same thing. Threats of ill treatment against the victim's children was considered torture. Et, um, We've already Alors, heard that the S21 interrogator's notebook said torture cannot be avoided. It differs only whether it is a little or a lot. But that book went on to describe de, de how S21 interrogators should psychologically deal with those they were interviewed. And it said, quote, attract their feelings to revolve around family matters, the lives of their wives and children. It is imperative to always remind them, do not resist and make matters more serious. Do not make us torture yet or do anything else serious that will impact on their health. It is imperative to remind them that they are not the chefs, that they do not resist and make matters worse. Prakant said the technique was also to allow the prisoner to think of his wife and children so that they could give the confession. Anunchia claims Poitoun was not tortured. No, there's, a, there's one, as I said, everyone in S21 was subjected to torture. We, we've all seen the photograph of Koitoun shackled. But there's also a notation in his interrogation, E3-1604, it says the following, after the guards handcuffed Atuk, still tried to write his story for further. He asked us to take off the handcuffs, saying that three days in handcuffs is enough. I decided not to let him write anymore and handcuffed him for 10 to 15 days, because in the past he had fabricated stories to attack the party forces. Can you imagine being shackled and handcuffed? You couldn't, couldn't even scratch your nose 24 hours a day? Vous vous imaginez, your Honor, no one believes confessions for good reasons. Monsieur, juges, even the Khmer Rouge did not believe confessions. Nunchia said to Tetsamba that when he read confessions, he found many of the crimes benign. Some people were not guilty. He said, quote, they normally confessed when they were beaten painfully and seriously tortured. And he talked about a confession of Chun Prasit, the DK ambassador to the UN, and he said he didn't believe it, quote, I thought they just faked these accusations. And I've already talked about the confession implicating Q Sampan and how uh, Nunchia ordered Doik to bury that. Even Paul Pot in Behind the Killing Fields book